So we're going to talk about uh, services in Drupal 8 and Drupal 8 in general. Uh, we're also going to talk about just services. The, uh, this talk is particularly aimed for people who... Uh, let's actually check how many people know what services are. How many people know uh, anything about play with Drupal 8 before? And uh, yeah, so uh, what we're going to cover is actually what the services are, a bit of history, a bit of definitions, I guess, so a bit of theory. Bear with us. We also packed the presentation with a few examples. If you have any questions, just raise your arm and we'll go straight away. So um, to actually sort out any confusions or anything like that. So uh, I guess that's what I basically got. And then we'll actually see a couple of presentations, a um, couple of demos in Drupal 8. We're also going to do a Birds of Fe Feather session uh, tomorrow. Uh, there's more info on that in the end of the presentation. So this is Jay. My name is Vladimir. We both work for Technocrat. If you didn't come say hi yet to us, we have a booth down there. Come and say hi to our guys. Talk we're about all, Drupal. We're all pretty friendly. Well, most of us. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few that may not be. So. But you can also chat on us on Twitter uh, and go to our website. So we are both, uh, we actually want to take a uh, trip back in time, not in the future, because I think that was in the previous session in the main auditorium. So we're actually going to uh, go and see what the internet was like before. And the best way to do it is actually see what uh, Drupal was like back, say, in something like 2002. So if we go back in the internet, uh, this is 22nd of January 2002, and this is a snapshot of Drupal.org back then. So if you haven't used Wayback Machine before, go to archive.org. You'll see how websites look like. And this is actually quite a modern website comparing to date. If you go, I think they have uh, some of the US websites from back in 1996. And basically, if we take this moment in time when internet was pretty much publicly accepted, widely uh, used, so basically it started as a click-by-click -click navigation. So, and um, going into 2000, that's what it was like. And basically, uh, the format people used was HTTP, so basically single request and get the information back. So you get a page, you get your media, and all that stuff. And eventually, once we get to um, current days, it's a bit more complex. So we know what Drupal is like at the moment. We actually know what Drupal.org uh, Drupal is like at the moment. Uh, it's becoming so big, it's actually, it has its own flow at DrupalCon North America. So there's the whole flow just dedicated to one side, Drupal.org. So as uh, internet became more complex, the data became more complex, the people needed new ways, new ways to treat data, to get data, and to interact with data. And that's basically where services kicked in. So uh, the technology that's responsible for the majority of the services is called AJAX, which stands for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. And uh, basically, uh, once click-by-click uh, -click navigation became uh, relatively obsolete, so now that the AJAX is responsible for that actually being loaded on the back end, while the user is actually interacting with the web page. There are different variations of that, but it's basically the, the model. So actually, if we're talking about web services, so web services is actually a protocol of the conversation between two machines or two computers. So there are strict requirements usually associated with it. And uh, the most popular protocol is used for it is uh, HTTP. So basically when you go and type HTTP in your browser, that's what you get. So the initial request is still basically getting this page given and get uh, all that information to load to the page. Formats vary, and we're going to take you through a quick history of the 
formats that were there before and why there are formats that actually became popular and still are there. So you actually know what you're talking about next time you're talking about Drupal 8 or services in the core you'll know what it actually means. Uh, usually also, no, to actually have a conversation between two computers, you actually have, need to have some sort of rules. So APIs, which is application programming interface, usually responsible for that. It kind of goes back into the rules, so actually requirements and rules. That's what machine need to communicate. Now we go into history. Oh. So uh, the original uh, original protocol for communicating between two computers was EDI, or Electronic Data Interchange. It was used since 60s, so even before the internet was there. So two machines were communicating, basically a simple, simple networks, or simple prototypes of the network were using EDI. Uh, it was documented and standardized in 1996, so 30 years it was actually after it was used, but uh, it was used in different variations, again, for years. Uh, it's a strictly formatted messages, and uh, basically it was designed for large-scale e-commerce, but it was quite handy, so people actually start using it for different sorts of communication. And if you actually want to talk the language, that's how it looked like. Very user-friendly. So if you want to have a conversation in EDI, that would look something like that. So uh, then the n n protocols start getting evolved, and basically people said, OK, there are some downsides of the actual using the uh, EDI. So remote procedure call. Uh, it's basically father of a lot of stuff we're using today was born. I'm not going to go into details, but it actually was based on a DCE protocol. Uh, it was more function-based, so rather than seeing one line of a bunch of letters, you have no idea, you can see the function, so one function calls another, so it says, give me a list of lectures, something like that. So a bit more user-friendly, a bit more uh, better for humans to understand without going to machine saying, can you explain to me what that means? Uh, it's, uh, th it actually became popular thanks to Linux, but Microsoft, as usual, came along and quickly adopted it to its own format and called it MSRPC. And a lot of stuff that actually came during the 90s on Microsoft platform, like all the architecture, if any of you developed for Microsoft technologies of Windows back in the 90s or early 2000s. You're probably familiar with that, well, uh, either DCOM or all the architecture. So they all were based on this uh, language communicating between two machines. Uh, then Corba came around. Uh, one of the guys, it actually was alternative to RPC. So uh, I think it was founded around early 90s as well. So it was Common Object Request Broker Architecture, that was CORBA st uh, stands for. And uh, it was also basically just a different communication language between two machines. Uh, if anyone developed here for Delphi or C++ Builder, they used CORBA heavily. Uh, it was powerful, maybe too powerful, but very complex. You actually have to spend lots and lots of time to actually understand how Corbo works and then tied it in into a programming language you were using. So there were a number of um, efforts to simplify and one of them came from Java's RMI interface. They came up with interop protocol to actually make it simpler. There were a number of attempts, but usually the complexity led to the point where each company would develop in their, all, their own language to communicate, which basically just uh, Segregation, segmentation of a CORBA itself became too hard. So again, as I said, there was one of many. Uh, there were one of many uh, very tr attempts to actually simplify it, but eventually it resulted in XML. Yeah. Okay, so XML. Um, I imagine most people here have worked with XML before. Uh, can I get a show of hands? Who has? Yeah, yeah. So we've got everyone. Um, so XML, extensible markup language, um, was formed out of SGML, um, uh, which stands for standard 
uh, generalized markup language. Um, and was built to be simple, readable by both humans and machines, um, as well as be generalized, so used for multiple purposes. Um, it largely differed from EDI and other binary formats, uh, format-based systems, um, due to being plain text, and when formatted as nested tags, was easy to read for humans. Um, so it was the multiple uses that it was intended for um, covered things like XHTML, which is like your modern uh, used by your modern web browsers, um, and the data transfer of XML was also ideal in many cases um, because it had strict formatting rules. Um, it was easy to validate if an XML snippet um, is coming back improperly uh, represented uh, to what you expected with your data. And as a result, it quickly became one of the most common formats uh, for web services messaging. So with the emergence of XML, um, a massive number of um, XML markup languages uh, came about. And these languages included... Uh, whoop, Next one. Sorry, I'm just losing my spot here. So um, these languages. Uh, sorry, here's an example of XML. Um, as you can see, there it's it's descriptive notation. Um, so you can see how you've got your note, to, heading, body uh, to describe your messaging format, and it's really quite easy to read. I'll just move on because people are already aware. Um, so from that, uh, quite a few standards and languages emerged. Uh, you have XML RPC, uh, which stood for, which stands for Extensible Markup Language Remote Protocol Callback. Oh, sorry, Remote Procedure Callback uh, Protocol. Yeah, there we go. Um, and without getting too in depth, uh, it basically encoded objects and data structures, and uses HTTP to mess, uh, to transport the data over the web. Then we have uh, ATOM and RSS, uh, ATOM standing for ATOM Syndication Format, and RSS uh, for Rich Site Summary. I know that there's also another definition, um, which is really simple. Somebody can help me out on that one? Syndication. Syndication, there we go. Um, and basically, they're XML-based languages that are used to publish frequently updated content, um, and then an RSS reader would interpret that information at the other end. And it would basically automate the process of checking for updated content from the user. And finally, SOAP, um, which is Simple Object Access Protocol. Um, who here has worked with SOAP? Who here hates SOAP? Yeah, so we've got, we've got a large number of people. SOAP, uh, personal opinion, it's, it's really difficult to work with. The documentation is massive. Um, but it became extremely popular, um, and the reason, the reason being um, was that it was based on XML RPC standard, but it took it much further. You can actually compare the docs between XML RPC and SOAP, and it's a huge difference, which in some ways was a benefit because it extended so much more functionality, but in other ways it was just a nightmare to try to get your head around. Um, and at the time, it was actually a revolution in web services. It was the foundation of a whole set of web services um, known collectively as WS Asterisk, which became known as Web Services Everything. Um, anyone who's picked up or looked at a WSDL file, uh, or any other number of files in that relationship, uh, would sort of probably duck their head for cover um, just because it can be so complex. Um, and I'll also, a bit discreetly, uh, I'll add that SOAP's lost quite a bit of its traction um, to REST and other XML uh, standards, but it's still very heavy in enterprise uh, applications. Um, so mainly, mainly your .NET, your Java, um, and especially those requiring computer-to-computer -computer, uh, communication. So moving on to something more enjoyable to work with, um, is JSON. So JSON stands for JavaScript Object, Object Notation. And I imagine everyone here has worked with JSON or knows what JSON is. Can I get a show of hands? Yeah, okay. Do I, do I stop asking the silly questions where everybody's done it? 
Um, so JSON is currently stealing XML's thunder. Um, and surprisingly, it was actually in introduced at a similar time to XML. Um, it was introduced in the early 2000s, but it really didn't pick up until we hit sort of the mobile revolution. And the reason why is because JSON was able to um, transmit smaller messages. Um, essentially, you didn't have all the, um, the notation markup that XML had, and with the smaller sizes, it also equated to quicker speeds of the transmission of the data. Um, and also, another thing is bandwidth. So with the evolution of mobile devices, bandwidth became an issue, particularly if you lived in Australia um, with our internet standards. Um, and from there, like XML, JSON is text-based and human-readable. Um, so the final thing that it did offer when it came about was that it was a stateful, real-time server-to-browser communication. Um, and it didn't have the need for any sort of additional browser plugins such as Flash or any Java applets. And that's, that there is just an example of JSON. Um, those familiar with JavaScript, and you all are familiar with JSON, would recognise that. Um, it was just so much simpler to um, communicate and to implement and to work with. Yep. Here we go. Are we going straight into you? Yeah. Yep. All right. So, just a bit of a fun example. Who uses Spotify? Not many. Spotify. Who doesn't know what Spotify is? Uh, well, basically, it's a music streaming service. And uh, they use web services a lot. So Jay going to talk about this. So we we'll decided yep. just enough of the theory. It's a yep. bit of a fun example. So essentially, uh, Spotify is a client application that connects to various services. Um, and in those services, this is, this is just a diagram of some of the infrastructure um, and the architecture Sorry, that Spotify have. Um, and it uses a client application um, on the user's computer. We'll talk about web for now. Um, which connects to a metadata service, uh, which provides information on artists, songs, and albums. It also has a user service, which is used for personalization um, for the user. And then there's also another service, which is their playlist service. Um, and that playlist service, uh, early on in uh, Spotify's, um, uh, I guess, their establishment. Um, it was actually a peer-to-peer -peer network. And what, um, what would happen is that you'd be accessing music from the client application and it would go out. If it didn't find it on your local cache, they, they do rely heavily on your local cache of your application. Um, and if they didn't find it there, it would then go off into a peer-to-peer -peer network and it would try to stream that music from other users who had already previously download, downloaded those files. Um, if it didn't find it there, it would then go to Spotify's servers. And whilst they were in their, their lean days bootstrapping the business, um, it was the way they could cut quite a few costs um, related to their servers. So um, Spotify, that architecture, is the prime example of where web development is tending to sort of move to. Um, you have a client application which could connect to a front-end framework and then, or it could be a mobile application, and it's completely decoupled from the back-end services. So why, why would this be so powerful? Does anyone, does anyone sort of have a good answer for why you would do that sort of thing? Definitely yeah. mobile app. Yep. Web. Yep. That's a good one. Any other suggestions? Yeah, exactly. And that points to this here. So doing, doing that with their services and decoupling everything allows you to create an API of your own. Um, and so when you create an application that is good enough to make other people want to connect to your application and use that for their own services, and to build their own websites that are built using your data, that's when you've made something special. And this is the Spotify web API. And I'm just going to jump out of here and go to the live thing because we have internet. It's a wonderful thing. 
Um, so this is just at developer.spotify.com um, and the main purpose is just to demonstrate a, a pretty good API. Um, Spotify do have a, a great API and without going through each endpoint, um, you can see that they've got get methods on things, put, delete. Um, we'll get into those details a bit later. But it's really well documented. So um, I might just sort of uh, jump up to here. If you go in, it's got a heap of information. And it's basically, when you're building your, your services with Drupal 8, this is kind of the level that you would want to achieve if you want other people to connect to your services as well. Um, and it's just an explanation of you've got the endpoints, request parameters, response formats, and then any error handling, um, expected data that you uh, receive uh, upon making a request, and oh, a comment section, because a comment section on your API is excellent. Um, so with, an ever, with a large increasing number of developers looking to build their websites, why would you want to expose your own API? And why would you want to take on this approach? And the answer is just back here. Oops. Oh, I thought oh, I lost that one. Third one. Sorry, technical difficulties. I swear I do web. I swear. View present. There we go. Okay. And this is why. Leverage. <laughs> leverage. Uh, so you want to be able to leverage what you do. Um, and that means that you'd want to connect to other people's services. And we're, <laughs> we're just going to keep going. <laughs> just in case you missed it. Um, now, you may want to connect to the Spotify API because you might have a, a music site and you want to quickly have access to a massive library of information you know, artists, albums, songs. Um, and to do that all yourself in the early stages is quite difficult um, and quite time consuming. So you want to be able to connect to as many different services as possible to try to get that through that lean stage. If that's your, if that's your aim, to build lean and to quickly, um, and to, to scale as well, to make the most of other people's services. All right. So. Uh We, we just show, saw one example of how you can leverage the services for Spotify, but there are tons of other services and alternatives to Spotify as well. So disclaimer is not an advertisement for Spotify. Yeah. So don't, uh, although you can check it out there. But uh, in terms of Drupal and websites in general, the services actually give you uh, basic examples of where you can use the source services by passing, for example, the uh, theming layer. One of the good examples can be done, for example, if you use Moodle before, uh, a lot of people complain it's a pain actually to create. Uh, Moodle is a learning management system, and in there you create your course, you create your week by week um, curriculum, you create your lectures inside your weeks. And a lot of people say the actual process is a pain, big, big pain. So for example, if you would have actual leverage of the services, you would be able to structure, uh, structure your form and actually, for example, quickly submit multiple items. So, for example, if you, you have your um, lecture, you have your um, week, you have your course, you can actually do it, for example, one page using services and it will create automatically 10 or 15 different uh, lectures and populate it just using the form. This is one good example where you can actually use services to override the existing functionality, or existing form, and just expand it. So. Um, uh, you can use it for web applications. So, for example, if uh, your business logic is more complex as well, the, the Moodle is a good example of actually creating some more complex form and using web services to create multiple items on the back end, making user actually to work with, the, what, with what they like rather than go, uh, sending user to uh, same page 15 times to create the same lecture or something like that. So the simplification is one of the things. Another thing is the mobile application just became very, very big. So a lot of things you use 
in your daily life actually relate to web, uh, mobile application. And a lot of them, I don't know, use RunKeeper, Facebook, Twitter, all that stuff uses services to actually update the data, create the data, delete the data. Uh, and that's why we're going to quickly look at Web Services API because we'll go into another example and to Drupal. So basically, to actually have a web service, you need to have a syntax. Syntax to understand how language works. Uh, you need to have methods, uh, understandable methods, and know what they do. So it's basically, let's say, it's an action. Uh, you need to have uh, some sort of um, URI. So you, basically, somewhere to connect, so like an endpoint. This one doesn't work. Fair enough. I can be loud. Uh, yeah, so you can actually uh, need to have some endpoints to connect. So if you if you didn't understand much of the previous slides with Spotify, where you can see a bunch of URLs, uh, there you go. So here's your method called get. So you get in endpoint. You got a particular uh, identifier to actually what are you getting, and yeah, the basically description of what it does. So. And then you get an extra information. So for example, why do you need an extra information? So if you want to create something, you basically need to send a parameter. If we're talking in uh, Drupal terms, if you want to create a page, you need to send title, you need to say the body tag, and you need to send if the page is published or unpublished, particular date, and so on and so forth. So actually, you need to send some parameters there. And data types, what are you actually sending? We're talking about JSON, we're talking about XML. Maybe you want to set EDI. <laughs> <laughs> no recommended. He doesn't. Uh, and uh, message formats, we've already been talking about them. So two most popular ones are JSON and XML. SOAP is still heavily used, so don't get your hopes high. There is some enterprise that's going to come after you say, I got this SOAP app. I want you to fix. And there are other formats as well. I'm not going to cover them. They're not in the cool. And we have a request action. And you've seen... Uh, how many request actions are there? Five. Uh, one came in late, but it's actually get, it's post, it's put, it's patch, and it's delete. Drupal actually have, Drupal 8 have four. And uh, we go to get. So get requests are used, obviously, to retrieve data from the resource. Um, and typically with get requests, um, you use a parameter um, in the URL to retrieve the, um, the data that you need. And because that request is done through the URL um, is a query parameter, uh, it has a limit of 2,048 characters. Um, if you're using a get request with more than 2,048 characters, I think you might be in trouble. Um, next one is post. Now, post sends new data um, in its complete form uh, to the resource. So it's basically used to create a new entry in the database table, um, and the query strings are actually sent in the HTTP message body, either as XML or JSON, um, as, both, as Vladimir discussed. And finally, delete, um, which deletes the resource uh, sorry, deletes, um, yeah, sorry, it deletes the resource um, and that uses the URL for the query parameters as well um, to identify which record in the database you wish to delete. So we also have uh, put and patch. So they all basically uh, designed to modify the content. The main difference between two of them is put is a complete replacement. So if you have a page, you're doing put on this page, it basically replaces everything. Whereas patch, it replaces, uh, yeah, so it sends and updates request, uh, creates a snapshot and copies the resource before it's updated. So it's basically have some mechanism to actually picking it all up. Whereas patch, what it does, you can actually, it's a partial update. So if you want to update the title, you use patch. And that's what Drupal is using instead of put. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about authentication, so how you can actually protect yourself with um, uh, so someone won't go onto your website using web services and actually deletes your page. And uh, there is one token on top of authentication, so on top of your credential you use, you also using, you are using token for patch, delete, put, and I think for post as well, but not forget. 
so authentication is basically your credentials. Uh, dr ba basic Drupal authentication is cookie. So when you put your login and password stored as a cookie token, and then you can access it, that actually proves Drupal you're authenticated. There's very popular o uh, OAuth, <laughs> which is used by Facebook, which is used by Twitter, which is very, very popular standard at the moment. And uh, just to get to another example, which is completely different, this is an example more for developers, but it actually mm -hmm. will show you how uh, services can be leveraged by developers. Yeah. So has anyone ever heard of Dream Factory? We have, we've, got, we've got one person. All right, cool. So this, this might be pretty interesting. So basically, Dream Factory uh, is a way to uh, connect multiple APIs into a single service. So I'll just um, go out here. And it's, it's open source, um, and it's built with PHP and Apache, and it uses MySQL as a default database. Um, and it automatically takes services um, that you attach to it and generates RESTful endpoints. Um, and what I'll do is I'll uh, jump into an example of this. So this is the this is the Dream Factory uh, interface, and I'm just going to skip over most of the stuff uh, just to get to the important parts. Um, but a quick overview is that you attach an application, and then from that application you attach multiple services. And in this example here, um, I've attached a MongoDB here, and which is a database. So it's basically is, yeah. the data. Sorry for anyone who's unfamiliar with MongoDB. And I've also attached the Rotten Tomatoes API, um, which is an external service. And what that does is, actually, I'll just give you a quick example. Uh, stop here. What that does is it generates the APIs in a single service that you can use. So you use familiar endpoints for all services. Um, and you can see here that we've got BBV. And if I just expand that, that will list out all the endpoints that you can use to interact with your database that you attach. Um, or it can use the default MySQL database. So you've got those get methods, post methods, put, patch, delete. And if we move down to the movies with Rotten Tomatoes, you'll see here that there's a get request. And this is just directly talking to Rotten Tomatoes and I can type in uh, something here. I don't know what, that's not going to come up with anything. Who's got, a, who's got an example of a movie name? Interstellar. Sorry, Interstellar. Uh, we'll go with Interstellar. Oh, Count Inactive. Ouch. I was using it yesterday. Authentication. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a good example of what happens when you don't use authentication. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so I'll, I'm going to actually go back up to the connection here that I've got with MongoDB because I know this one should work. And just to get request, um, I'm just going to search for the content table in this database. And you get the results there in the response body. So what, what I really want to talk about with this is that it's a quick way to have multiple services connected and to develop using just that single URL structure. Um, and it will save a lot of time instead of sort of having to format many different ways of uh, retrieving data from multiple services, you can actually aggregate them all into this one service. And another cool thing about this um, is this interface here is Swagger. So Swagger here um, is like a documentation UI where you plug in your services and I'll just give you an example of what you need to add to this service. You simply add a JSON file for Swagger and enter in some details and then it will build that API documentation for you. So you'll be able to pass on your API um, to somebody else and have documentation created very quickly. So reverse scroll gets me every time. So that there is an example and it's just basic JSON, um, and you fill out some details, and from the, those details, you can then build out a UI via API docs. 
can yeah. be very helpful when we have lots of services exposed in Drupal to actually leverage another open source system to give the details of those services exposed in a nice manner. Yeah. Is that oh. standard or is that something unique? Sorry, For back. No, I was wondering if this was something Dream Factory came up with or if it was like more of an industry standard kind of thing. No, so that's uh, Swagger is found at swagger.io and we'll have the link in um, the reference. references section, the presentation. And currently there is a Drupal 7 module, uh, a Drupal 7 sandbox module that has tried to integrate this. Um, they haven't touched Drupal 8, but I think it's going to be really powerful for Drupal 8 with everybody working predominantly with services and wanting to expose those services to be used either across your own applications or um, for anyone to use and having that documentation built. So I think it's it's great. Um, you get, I'll just quickly jump back in. You get access, um, which is built on the fly, to information about the API endpoint. Um, you get an example schema um, of the response class. Um, you've got response messages that can be documented. Um, and, they, and in the response itself, um, as I showed this before, you get the response body and you know exactly what sort of data you're working with. And somebody who doesn't know anything about your application can go on, have a look at this documentation and get a good idea as to what to expect and how to, form, how to work with your uh, API. And finally, we're here to actually talk about Drupal, so it's time. So you, anyone heard term headless Drupal before? Yep, so headless Drupal refers to services, and it means they basically chop off Drupal's head <laughs> and not using the theming layer, which is, there are lots of talks about it, what's the best way. So it's just an alternative way to actually use the Drupal by using it as a data storage, and exposing the services, and actually leveraging the services um, that we were talking about. It was one of the main core initiatives. And there's a lot of documentation about it. And you can go on Flick through archive and see how big development it was. It actually resulted in a few turns. Uh, but basically, it went through a few stages. They basically, when the initiative was announced, uh, they say, we, we need to build a context, which is basically exposes the data first. Then we need to build the plugins which basically the way for developers to expose the services. And then we actually need to expose the service. So that's what the initiative went through. And now we have services in, uh, in the back end and layouts as well, of course, uh, to actually uh, how they're going to look. So that services in core, but also services are in views. We're going to go through, we got about seven, eight minutes. We're going to go through the examples of it now. So there are also additional modules that I'm going to cover uh, that uh, basically just uh, gives you a better understanding of um, what services are and how to use them. Actually gives you visual stuff rather than going and looking at it in the back end. And also there's some services development postponed to 8.1, which we basically cover just a touch base in the end. OK, so four main modules that come with Drupal 8. It's whole HAL, there is HTTP basic authentication, there is RESTful web services, and there is serialization. So we'll start with the RESTful web services. So again, it actually exposes the services through a REST API, so it creates makes Drupal one of those applications we saw before. So let's all go and build uh, our next Spotify. Uh, we can expose other resources, uh, and it also, it, it depends on the serialization module, which is, actually converts data from the format of your choice to uh, Drupal language and back. So then there is HAL, which stands for Hypertext Application Language. It's extends serialization module, and it's a primary format for Drupal to understand the service you're sending it. And again, it can be in code balls in JSON and XML that we were talking about. And this is some developer's info. So it basically enables a couple of keywords for Drupal. Uh, then there is authentication module, which basically provides um, 
service based on cookie. So if you log in into your Drupal, you can go and query your stuff. Uh, but it's, it is recommended if you're making a production site to configure SSL, which is secure protocol to communicate over. And there is OAuth module already available for Drupal 8, so you can actually go and install these modules. Uh, and uh, the authentication, this is a link for authentication, which I'm going to cover in a second. We're going to use Postman REST Cloud, and we're going to communicate with our Drupal site. So let's do that. So we have our Drupal 8 website. We have some content, something like uh, uh, we created three pages. The content type actually called page element, but we had node one, two, and three. So uh, in order to actually get JSON from the view, we're going to use uh, URL. So it's node three. Go back to our Drupal. This is our node three called mission. What's our mission? Alternative accessible. So this is the data we actually currently have in Drupal. So if we'll try to send the request, one more thing. We actually say, as you can see, we're sending the request to the same URL to node slash three as the actual node is. And uh, if we send the URL, it's going to fetch uh, JSON. The reason it fetches JSON instead of uh, HTML, it's this line. You're actually sending the header that accepts uh, application JSON. If we delete that and send the same request, we're going to get our HTML page, basically exactly what you see in browser. So by just changing, you basically can request the same URL, but depending on what you want to request, Drupal would actually feed you stuff differently. And I guess this is the main thing for the services. So same thing if you want to delete a note. Again, this has come, um, now we need the actual authentication unless you allow everyone to delete stuff. And first, if, um, again, I'm sending here, I can select delete. Yeah, yeah I'll, uh, first I'll show that it actually says 404 not found. So we know there is a node number three. So we'll go here, it's actually a mission. So we'll update that. Come here and say, I want to update node number three. And uh, it actually says 403 forbidden. So that's where the permissions come comes in. So first, we need to allow the per, uh, user to delete node. So let's, at the moment, let's do what you, you'll never do in any environment, is allow anyone to delete the node. So we'll say, uh, Anonymous user can uh, call delete on the resource, so it's all in permissions in uh, Drupal 8. So we save that. We'll try to delete again. It says 403 forbidden. Does anyone know why? Basically, to prevent uh, people from actually deleting stuff, you also need a token. So if you work with any API like Twitter API and stuff, apart from your credentials, you'll also get an application token, a Twitter confirm. So it's like double confirmation uh, that you actually are the person who wants to delete or update stuff. Uh, token in Drupal 8 sits in a URL called REST session token, and you have to type it to get it. So it provides me with API token. I'm going to go here and post, and it's actually called XCSRF token, which I posted in the. So let's try to do it again. So it's node 3 send, and it says 204 no content, which means it was successfully deleted. So I guess sacrifice to the guys of the demo <laughs> was good enough. So. Uh, Drupal also provides uh, REST in view. So for example, if you have a bunch of pages and you want to provide a summary for those pages, uh, you, you can actually uh, just give them straight away in one request. So for example, I had three pages. If I want to 
uh, I receive them in one request. I can send the re uh, REST request to the views. Views, it's a visual query builder. So it basically aggregates data from Drupal and exports list of data. So you can select JSON and XML. For those people who know views, you go and add new view. And then, uh, you, as before, as Drupal 7, you have page settings, you have block settings, and you also uh, have uh, REST export which is basically gonna give you the same details. And uh, the way you, you select the format, you, you actually go into a view settings and you select JSON or XML. Uh, REST UI, it's very handy module. It actually provides you with a visual, uh, with a visual data. So basically it says, okay, what do you want to enable? Do you want to, for your content, do you want to get, pause, delete, and patch? It also provides those permissions we saw before. And as you can see, there is a resource name and pass, which is, at the moment, it looks like that, but we can also integrate it with uh, Swagger. Swagger and actually expose uh, the APIs to external users. So you can actually select an authentication depending on, so you can select authentication cookie, simple, uh, simple authentication, or, or auth, if you install the module. So that's, yeah. And there is a couple of more modules. If you're interested in authentication, there are references to a couple of more modules. Uh, one more note on Drupal 8 is actually it's built on Symfony, which is a framework for PHP. It has a thing called Silex, which is now built in in Drupal 8. And it's basically just give you easy way to expose a, a, uh, endpoints for the services as well. It's a uh, very popular. Uh, framework for people who actually work with Symfony. And here's a bit more details about that. All right, no, I'll be quick because we're running out of time. Um, so has anyone uh, tried to connect to an external domain um, using JavaScript from their website and come across this error? So yeah, this one's, this one, the first time you come across this, you look, you think to yourself, what the hell's going on? Um, basically, it is because of cross-origin um, access. And what it does is it was implemented um, on the browsers uh, to prevent communication between two sites uh, with different domains. And the reason it was put in place was to help prevent uh, cross-site scripting. Um, now, uh, I was going to talk about that, but um, look up cross-site scripting if you're unaware. I believe everyone would have some idea as to what that is. Um, and what's come about from that is an initiative by W3C to standardise CORS, which is cross-origin resource sharing. Um, and you can go to w3.org for a dry read of CORS. Um, there's also another website called enable-CORS. Um, we, we're going to have the, re, uh, the references, uh, the links in our references section. Um, but basically, uh, with Drupal services, um, you may find yourself wanting to go with a a headless approach, but um, at the moment Drupal doesn't support that. Um, and what that means is ordinarily you would have an access control allow origin header um, in the API on the, on the site that um, contains the APIs to request um, the endpoints from, and you just have to point that to your domain um, that you want to use to query that. And with it not being in Drupal 8, there is good news. Uh, it's actually coming for 8.1. Um, so there is a thread, which we'll put a uh, link to in the references as well, um, where there is a current patch in this same thread that you can use now um, if you want to be able to have a, a headless front end, uh, sorry, a headless yeah, front end um, connecting to <coughs> your Drupal site that may be on a different domain. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be useful for many different reasons. But it is coming, um, and just check out that thread for the patch um, to work with in the meantime. So yeah, we are doing birds of uh, feather tomorrow at 2.30. <coughs> so we're going to display a bit more hands-on developers approach with services of, with Drupal 8 and Drupal 7, and talk about all the so co all sorts of trouble with services and solutions as well. So come, if you if, if you got anything to talk to, come if you want to ask something or just here, just <coughs> come to us. We're in room F. And uh, thanks, guys. Do you have any questions?
Yes. Hey, um, great presentation. Uh, Drupal 7 has a services module. Is Drupal 8 is exactly the same, or what's the difference? I mean, apart from that, it's a core. Yep. But is there any difference between a Drupal 7 services module and Drupal yep. services? It, it was completely rewritten for Drupal 8. Yeah. And I'm not, I, I was trying to find the information, the Silex. I'm not sure how far Silex is integrated in Drupal 8 initiative. Larry Page uh, at Krell, Krell uh, quite, he is a lead on that. So I think if you want to get more in depth, uh, you, you can contact him. And uh, he is quite a talkative what guy. What about API wise? Like, um, does it do the same things? I mean, I understand it's for reason. Yep. But the, like, because the Drupal 7 uh, service module, you can still like, do nodes, and users, and entities, and you can do view as integration. So does the Drupal 8 provide more than that? Uh, how much more? I'm not sure how deep goes Drupal 7, but at the moment we found two problems. So first problem, you cannot expose blocks through and second problem you cannot expose menu links you can have one menu link if you know the menu link id so one of the things uh, the rest of it is available so you can expose views you can expose all the content uh, expose particular content type and modify pretty much everything apart what from you expose, like, the views? Uh, no you can't do that because views don't support menus yet that's another problem we found so there's a lot of stuff that actually postponed into 8.1, but one of the things we're going to show off tomorrow is I created a plugin to expose the links in the menu. Yeah. So for example, if you want to create the you know modern one-page thing and want to expose a bunch of uh, blocks and a bunch of stuff, now you can do that. Oh, but you cannot query blocks. So basically, if you want to expose views and want to expose uh, uh, views and pages, you can put them together in one menu, then we can read list menu. So it's not available out of the box, but I think it's common because uh, both blocks and menus are entities. I guess it just wasn't there in the time of uh, making this presentation. Mm. Yeah. Um, you said that in Drupal I only had four of the five methods. Yes. And it's missing put. Put. Yeah. I think put is missing. Yeah, it's put. Yeah. I, I, Uh, uh, new new content will be with post, um, and then to update content, you'll be using patch. Oh, yeah. Anyone else? Thanks for coming, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hope to see you tomorrow.